How many of you all agree that victory is sweet? How many of you all agree with that? And don't you think it's a wonderful thing that the God of heaven invites us to live in triumph? Aren't you thankful for that? So let's read our text. This is our theme verse for the week where the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Well, I can say to you tonight that I sure am thankful that Almighty God causes us to triumph in Christ. I, I would think you could give thanks for that as well, right? It's a wonderful thing that we have victory. We don't always live like it, and sometimes we're discouraged, and sometimes we're defeated, and we all have besetting sins, and the world around us, and issues we face in life. But the God of heaven invites you in this verse and lets you know in this verse that his desire, his plan, is that we live in victory. The Bible says things like this, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Isn't that just a, isn't that just a triumphant verse? We're more than conquerors. The Bible says there is now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Well, those little verses just put you on the shouting ground, don't they? We have no condemnation. We're more than conquerors. We always can triumph in Christ. And you remember our little outline by now, you kind of ought to have it in your heart if you've been here much at all. And the outline goes like this. It's assumed. He says it just like it's a done deal. It's assumed, of course, we have victory. It's accomplished, not in our strength. Our sufficiency is not us or how long we've been saved or how much intelligence we have, or, or how much Bible knowledge we have. Our sufficiency, chapter 3 and verse 5 says, is of God. He's the one that does it. So that's why he says here, he causes us to triumph in Christ. And then the whole point we've kind of been zeroing in on is that our victory is not automatic. It doesn't just happen. God has a plan. He, he has steps we have to take. So remember, we talked in the Sunday morning service about a few of those. You got to know your standing. You got to know who you are in Jesus Christ. How many of y'all praise God you're forgiven? How many of y'all praise God that you're clean? You praise God that you're a saint, that you're held in the palm of his hand? All of those things are true, whether you feel it or not. You are a child of God. You're part of the family, which is why you can go in the very presence of God and you can say, my Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. You can go right into God's presence because you are part of the family. That's your standing in Jesus Christ. So you gotta know that. You gotta settle your salvation. This is Tuesday night, and most often on a Tuesday night, we're a church crowd. But let's just not take that for granted. Do you know for sure? Are you absolutely settled in your heart that you know Jesus Christ? Can I say it like this? The Bible way? Amen. Yeah, there's a ton of churches there's a ton of preachers. There's all kinds of religions. But there's one Bible and one Savior and one way to know God, and his name is Jesus Christ. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me, Jesus said. He said, I'm the door. By me, if any man enters in, he shall be saved. And the apostle Paul, he said to the Philippian jailer, he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He said to the church at Rome, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What we've got to do is humble ourselves. We've got to come to God as a sinner. Have you ever done that? Have you ever confessed the fact, come face to face with the fact that you're a sinner, that you're worthy of hell, that you're deserving of hell, that you don't have eternal life, that you're without hope because you're without God and without Christ and without forgiveness? It starts with humility. When I humble myself before God and I come to God on that basis and I, 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 come, I come humbly because I have nothing to offer, I can't do it, but I turn to the Savior Jesus Christ who did it all on that basis. Jesus, the basis of faith in Jesus Christ, trust in Jesus Christ, depending on Jesus Christ, he'll wash away my sins and give me everlasting life. I don't deserve it. I can't earn it. Baptism can't do it. Church membership can't do it. But there's a Savior named Jesus Christ who can save anybody. And that includes you, and that includes me, and includes your relatives, includes your neighbors, includes everybody you work with, and everybody you know, and every person you will ever meet. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. And so you got to settle your salvation. You got to get that settled. Well, if you're in this Tuesday night service, and there's an uncertainty, 
You just, you, you, you wrestled with it. You don't have to continue on. You, you, we, we can take you to the Bible. The Bible has the answer how you can know that you're on your way to heaven and you can know it for certain. We'd love to help you with it. So you got to know your standing. You got to settle your salvation and you got to grow spiritually. We've been zeroing in on that for several nights. We talked Sunday night. How many of y'all were here Sunday night? Were you? We talked about our help, the word of God. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. We talked last night about our hindrances. We got to we got to deal with our weights. What are those weights? Those are those things remember that hold us back and they pull us down. And we zeroed in on on, on especially entertainment and technology because that's a deadly detriment to our spiritual growth in, in our generation. Tonight, we talk about our help, that's, that's growing spiritually, and our hindrances. And tonight, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1, and let's talk tonight about our hurts. Our hurts. How many of you know, how many of you know that hurts are part of living in a sin-cursed world. How many of y'all know that? There's a lot of hurts in life, aren't there? A lot of challenges, a lot of valleys, a lot of storms, a lot of trials, a lot of disappointments or discouragements or even persecutions. When I was a teenager, I remember mom and dad took me to a revival meeting in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. And I was a young teenager, and I remember going to that revival service, and there was this evangelist, this camp meeting evangelist, and a mountain preacher, and he made this statement. I've probably even quoted him here before because I've quoted him so many times, but in his sermon, he said this. He, uh, he gets up to preach, and he said, now, ladies and gentlemen, he said, I want you to know tonight you're either in a storm, you're coming out of a storm, or he said, brother, one is headed your way, and I thought, wow, isn't that encouraging? Sure, God, I came to church here. That little nugget of encouragement but how many of y'all know that he wasn't far off? There's a lot of valleys in life in there, a lot of hurts that we face in life. And you know something, ladies and gentlemen, the hurts that you'll face in life have the potential to cause you to lose victory and to be down and discouraged or to have triumph in your life in an unusual and unbelievable and incredible way. The hurts of life have to be handled wisely and correctly. This summer, this summer I preached for the first time ever in a camp in the mountains of Colorado near Marble. And there's nothing in Marble, Colorado. Uh, there is a uh, little town there, the little town. I mean, just, just this little, 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 little spot on the map. And in fact, my GPS wouldn't get me there. I actually had to uh, use this thing called a map. And uh, it was a little challenging. I hadn't done that in a while. But I had to go to Marble, Colorado. My phone died. It wouldn't get me there. I made it to Marble. And then I turned right at the stop sign in town. It was pretty easy to find that and uh, turned right at the stop sign and went up the side of the mountain, about 9,700 feet elevation to a camp. And I uh, went down in this canyon, I went up the side of the mountain and it pointed, here, the camp is this way. And I was like, uh, is there a road over there? And, and uh, there was a road over there. You just had to be real careful that you got on it. And uh, so I eased over on that road and went down into that canyon and I mean, we were way up there, way up there. It was, it's hard to breathe. There was no oxygen up there. We had a phenomenal camp week. And I, there, my first service there, the first, just right away, I met this teenage boy, and I had dinner with him. I, I went to their cafeteria, and I sat down, and I ate, and here's this young man, and I introduced myself, and he introduced himself, and, and he and I ate several meals together. He was happy. Uh, he just, uh, he, he smiled. He, he just was a pleasure to be around. Just a teenage guy that was nice to be around. And later in the week, they had a little uh, competition. They were going to let kids sing and, and, and choose a couple of winners, you know. And they also had a preaching competition. They didn't preach five minutes. Any camper preach five minutes, and we'll let uh, Brother Young and several other, you know, the youth pastors, they'll, they'll choose one of you. As you know, you know, we'll say, okay, he did the best, and we'll give you a prize of some sort. And there was quite a few guys lined up to preach, including this young man who was so nice and so happy. And I mean, it just seemed like, boy, if anybody had it together, that kid, boy, he must really, really be an amazing teenager. And he got up to preach in the, in the auditorium, and he reads his text. And then he starts telling a story. It was dumb. I, I was dumbfounded. He talked about his dad, 
who was so abusive that his dad went to jail five different times for either beating up his mom or the kids themselves. The kid told this story about his dad, this angry, brutal man. In fact, the guy had so many times that he was sent to jail for domestic violence that he was actually deported and no longer lives in the USA. He was sent back home to Greece where he came from when he moved to the USA. Here's a boy that grew up in a home where there was yelling and screaming and fighting. A mom was beat up and dad beat him up and his brothers and dad said, the kid doesn't even know his dad at all now. Dad, dad, dad has nothing to do with him. And yet he sat at the table at this Christian camp with joy, with happiness, smiled, preached an absolutely phenomenal five-minute sermon. If I could preach that good in five minutes, I'd do it. How many of y'all wish I could? I, I, I figured. It was amazing. You know what I thought? There's a young man in the midst of the hurts of his life who found triumph. He found victory. Boy, it changed everything. I met his brother. Same thing. Happy young man. In fact, his brother, his brother's 14 years old, and his brother said to me at the end of the week, he said, Brother Young, can I talk to you? And I said, well, sure, son, what's up? He said, uh, someday I plan to get married. Good. <laughs> he said, uh, when I do, would you do the wedding? <laughs> it's like, well, sure. I mean, how can you say no to that? And uh, I gave him my number, so who knows? I may be heading somewhere Someday to marry a boy whose dad's out of the country who, who doesn't have a dad in his life, but who loves the Lord. Amen. You know what I'm trying to say to you? You're going to find here in 1 Peter that Peter talks to these believers about the valleys, the persecutions, the hurts, the trials, the disappointments, and it's a message that all of us need because in the hurts of life, you can find triumph in Christ. Look in chapter 1. You got your Bible? 1 Peter chapter 1. Look at it. 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter starts right away in verse 1 with these words. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein, watch this now, wherein ye greatly rejoice. Though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, I love this, verse 8, whom having not seen, ye love. In whom though now you see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now just stop right there and think about that. Isn't that kind of a triumphant passage? It's just got triumph all over it. He, he talks here in verse 3 about a lively hope. We have a lively I looked up that word lively, and it has the idea of a real deal hope. Like, it's a real deal. I, I'm not just this, this religious person. There's something real in my life. There's a God in my life. There's a real event that happened in my life. I got saved, and God changed my life. I've got a real hope in my life. It's lively. It's alive. It's working. It's a real deal to me. I love that verse. Then he talks about this incorrupt inheritance. Uh, that's, uh, that's a great word, isn't it? How many of y'all are thankful that there's coming a day you are going to receive an inheritance from the God of the universe? 
My mom and dad are country folks, you know, and uh, they, my dad didn't finish high school, so he's worked hard all his life just, you know, to make a living and things. And some years ago, my wife and I, we were going down with our kids to visit my parents, and my, my parents are funny people, and uh, they were so excited about our coming, and, and, and yet not so much about seeing us as it was they had something to show us. So my mom was like, when do you think you're going to get here? Because we got a surprise for you. I can't wait to show you something. Man, I, they were so excited. And uh, we lived way out in the country. I mean, I, 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 was, I was raised in this tiny little house. We, we, were just, we were just country people. And we'd drive out through the mountains, you know, to my mom and dad's house. And you're not, you're not going to believe what they had to show me. You know what my parents did? You're going to just be shocked by this, church. You're going you're gonna to be overwhelmed by this. You know what they had to show me? They had paved their driveway. They were so excited about a paved driveway. And my brother came over and my brother was like, I said, hey, what do you think about that? I'll tell you what I think about that, he said. Mom and dad are spending our inheritance. That's what they're doing. And, and, and maybe he was right. My parents are so funny. My dad, I remember my dad bought his first pickup truck, his first brand new pickup truck. He's so excited, he called me. He's like, hey, son, guess what I did? I bought, I bought me a brand new pickup. And I said to my dad, what'd you do with the old one? Because I was thinking, you know, hey, it's a standard, you know, a stick shift. And I thought that'd be a great truck to train my kids to drive on. You can't text and drive a stick shift. How many of y'all know about that? <laughs> and I thought, I need to buy that stick shift off my dad. And here'd be a good deal. I said, so dad, dad got this new truck. What'd you do with the old one? My dad said, well, I kept it, son. He said, you don't think I'm going to drive that new one, do you? And the man was serious. So they drive it on Sunday night, I think. They go to church in dad's truck on Sunday night. The new truck, that's what they do. So I, my folks, they, they're spending my inheritance. Can you believe that? But there's an inheritance in the Bible here where the Bible says it's incorruptible, fadeth not away. Right now it's reserved in heaven. wonder what he's got there for me. wonder what he's got there for me. I don't, I don't know what heaven's gonna be like, but part of heaven is there's an inheritance up there and it's already there and God it out and it's waiting on me to get there. Isn't that shouting ground? I love these triumphant verses. You find in the fifth verse that we are kept by the power of God. I can't keep myself saved. One of the reasons I believe in eternal security is I couldn't save myself. I couldn't get myself to heaven to begin with. Well, how do I think I can do it after I got saved? I'm still the same old guy that I was before I got saved. But Jesus came in, and he's working on me, and he's going to keep on working on me, and he's going to keep on working on me. The Bible says, Paul told the church at Philippi, he said, I'm confident of this very thing, that the God who began a good work in you, he will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. I can't save myself. I can't keep myself saved. So Jesus does it all in that shouting ground. These are triumphant verses. And you get to verse 6, and it changes gears. Starts with rejoicing and ends with heaviness. You ever experienced that? Heaviness? The hurts of life? A family problem? A wayward child or grandchild? A death? A sickness? a disappointment. You've experienced those, haven't you? You know about those hurts, don't you? You know what I would bet? I'd bet there's people that at one time sat in these pews, but life hurt them. And tonight they're far from God. He still loves them. He still cares for them. But the hurts of life destroyed their victory. Now they're not serving God. Most of us would know somebody like that, wouldn't we? All of us have to be aware that the hurts of our life are intended by God to be something he uses to bring triumph into our life, not destroy triumph. Amen. So several things I'd teach you tonight. How do you, how do you handle your hurts so you can have triumph in Christ? Four ways. Number one, write this down somewhere. Number one, recognize you're not alone. Number one, recognize you're not alone. Have you, ever, have you ever thought through those first two verses in chapter one? They are theologically a little challenging sometimes. 
Sometimes they confuse us a little bit. And the Bible says here, Peter is writing as an apostle of Jesus Christ to the, what's the next word there? It's strangers, plural. Now chew on that. He's writing to these people, and what he's writing about is the, are these believers, they have really been through it. They're being persecuted. Many of these strangers, the reason he says you're scattered through Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia is because they have suffered so greatly for their Christianity. They no longer live in their homeland or their hometown. They've lost their jobs. They've lost their families. They've lost their home. They've now been scattered. They had to find a new home. And the word, by the way, this is, uh, I, I, would, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, uh, go too far with this, but, but I, I did look something up and notice something. The word elect in verse 2 actually grammatically modifies the word strangers. So if you were literally to translate it right out of the Greek, literally, he's literally saying here, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the elect strangers according to the foreknowledge of God. In other words, in other words, watch this because this will help you. This passage is not about soteriology. He's not talking about how we get saved. It's not that we get saved because we are chosen by the foreknowledge of God. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is the God of heaven chose these strangers knowing, knowing that they were really going to suffer. They were going to lose families, jobs, houses, inheritances. He's saying to them, God chose you knowing that. And notice it's plural, strangers. The point simply being is, you're not alone. You ever feel that way? I, I, I can't bear this. Nobody knows what I'm going through. I'm telling you tonight, brothers and sisters, the hurts of life are never something we face alone. They are common to man. And, and, and you're not alone. Isn't that encouraging to know when somebody else is there in a difficult time? Isn't that encouraging? You're not alone. I, uh, I told you I was raised in the country. Our family was fairly poor. And uh, till I was in elementary school, we had this thing that most people in our generation know little about. At our house, we had this. At our house, we had this thing called an outhouse. Amen. We were that poor. Can you all believe that? And uh, we really were. And I think it's the weirdest thing in the world. You can go to Gatlinburg now, and you can go to these stores in Gatlinburg and places like that, and you can buy little, you know, what, what do they call those that you hang on your Christmas tree? What are those called? What are, uh, or, that's ornaments. I start to say elements, but that just didn't sound right. You can go buy ornaments of little outhouses, and I just wanted you to know, brothers and sisters, I'm against it. Don't you buy me an outhouse to hang on my Christmas tree because it ain't happening, okay? <laughs> one of the weirdest things when I was a kid is, is uh, one of the things I hated when I was a kid is having to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Amen, so it's dark out there. And I, I, I you know, I, I hate to admit it, but I was scared of the dark. It was dark out there at night. But I had a wonderful mom. You know what my mom would do? My mom would say, all right, son, I'll go with you. Now, she didn't really go with me. You know what I mean? Do I need to explain that further? Are we okay with this? But she was there. She said, all right, I'm out here, son. It's okay. I'm out here. I'm, I'm out here with you. There was something special about not being alone. Somebody else there made a difference. My papa used to take me coon hunting. And uh, he'd call me every Friday night, and he'd say, you want to go? And uh, he didn't have to, you want to go? Yep. He'd come pick me up in the, in the Jeep with his coon dogs, drive me out in the mountains, and we'd let the coon dogs out and let them run. I remember one night going out there. It was always fun because Papa would take me out there. And we'd, uh, you know, we'd spend the night out there together hunting and, and listening to the dogs run. And, 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 and I was always with him. I didn't like the dark, but I was with Papa. 
He had one of those, uh, one of those uh, miner's hats that had the carbide lantern on it. Some of you have no idea, but he had one of them. That's why I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. And I loved hunting with my papa. One night we went hunting. I'll never forget this. One night we went hunting, and we're up on this ridge, and, and way down in the valley below us, uh, the dogs started barking, and my papa got so excited. Oh, my goodness. He said, we're going to get a big one tonight. He was so excited, and we listened. We stood there waiting, because you wait till they run. They're going to tree this raccoon. That's what we're waiting for. And we listened, and uh, they ran down that valley. You could hear them, and they got fainter, and, fa- and they ran plumb out of hearing. And we stood there a moment, and Papa says, just wait a minute, see what happens. And all of a sudden, you, I think I can hear them coming back. And they came back. They ran right down the valley below us there, and they went this way, plumb out of hearing. And then he got mad. He, he did, my papa. He said, I'm telling you right now, I've paid $1,400 for those dogs. They are chasing a fox. He said, my coon dog's no better than that. I can't believe he said they're running a circle. That's, he said, that fox will run those dogs all night in a big circle, and we'll waste this night. Boy, he was mad. And I'm just, he's stomping around. I can't believe that. The crazy dogs are mine. I paid too much money. He was just hopping mad. And, and when they started coming back, he started calling for them. Susie, Sally, come on, stop. Get off that. He yelled, and one of them stopped barking. And my dad, or my, my papa, he must have known their voices. He was like, come on, Sally, good girl. Come on, come on, come on. He's yelling for his dog. And I'll never forget, that dog came running out of the dark, ran up to my grandpa. He pulled out his pistol and shot it cold stone dead. He didn't. I just made that up. <laughs> Some of y'all looked real worried. (laughs) But what he did do, he didn't shoot it. What he did do is he pulled out this leash and hooked that dog. And then he turned around to me in the dark, in the woods. He said, now, son, here. He said, you take this dog, you go back to the Jeep, and you wait on me there. And he turned around and walked down the, I'm going to go get the other dog, he said. And he disappeared. I'll never forget standing in the middle of the woods with nothing but a dumb coon dog. <laughs> what am I gonna do? I don't, know, I don't know where the Jeep is. And, and the coon dog took off and I held on for dear life. And to this day, I gotta tell you, I just wanna praise God for that, that coon dog because she took me back to the Jeep. And I got back to the Jeep and I standing there in the dark with that dog. And then I turned around and Papa walked out of the woods. He didn't go down that valley to catch that dog. He's following me the whole time, and I was too dumb to know it. I wasn't alone. I was shaking in my boots. I was so scared. But I didn't have to be, because I wasn't alone. That's a silly illustration, brothers and sisters. But when you go through the hurts of life, I'm here to tell you, Number one, you're not alone because these strangers are plural. We all hurt. We all face valleys. We all go through darkness. We all have to face the issues of living in a sin-cursed world. And you got to think right about it. You ever heard this? He says, you know, God gave me cancer. I know what we mean, but that's not true. It's not that God says, all right, I'm going to give you something evil in your life. That's a result of living in a sin-cursed world. It's not that God did that to me. God is not the author of evil. He intends good. He knows the thoughts he thinks toward us, thoughts of peace and thoughts of goodness and thoughts of favor and blessing. The evil is the sin-cursed world. And all of us have to face that. You, 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 can, you can be as healthy as a horse. You, you can be so religious about what you eat that you never in your life eat anything except that which is act, exactly what you're supposed to eat. But the fact of the matter is, you still got to die. It's just going to come a day, you know, that you're just going to be like, all right, it's my time. I always remember the preacher. What was that guy's name that, uh, that uh, was so strict? Lester Roloff. Do you all remember that name, Lester Roloff? Lester Roloff didn't eat nothing that was unhealthy. I mean, he wouldn't drink coffee. How many of y'all think that's worth praying for a man about? 
Wouldn't even drink coffee. And then, bless his heart, died in a plane crash. Can you believe that? And I thought when I heard that, I was just a kid. I was just a kid, and maybe I was carnal about it. But I used to, to hate when preachers like that would come to my church because they'd come to church and preach against everything, and my mom and dad would get on board. And my mom and dad like, well, we've got to change that, and we've got to change that, and we've got to quit that, and we've got to give that up because, you know, Brother Roloff said you can't do it. And uh, one thing, praise God, my parents never listened to him about. They still drink coffee. So Brother Roloff didn't win that one. I mean, he tried, but he didn't win. And I remember when they said, you know, he died of an accident. I thought, well, all that healthy eating sure helped him, didn't it? Now, that's a terrible way to think, isn't it? But here's the whole deal. I'm not being mean about that. I don't mean to be. But what I'm simply saying to you tonight is the fact of the matter is the effects of a sin-cursed world are going to affect you. That's why we have hurts in our lives. So number one, you're not alone. Don't ever forget that. You are not alone. I would say to you tonight, brothers and sisters, the one whom you love, that's what he said here, whom having not seen ye love, in verse 8, the one whom you love cares about you. The one whom you love chose you knowing that you would face the effects of a sin-cursed world. And the one whom you love loves you. And the one whom you love is using you, and the one whom you love suffered for you. Why did the Bible tell us that Jesus came and bore our griefs and carried our sorrows? Because that's the effect of living in a sin-cursed world, isn't it? Grief, sorrow, tragedy, heartaches, brokennesses. Isn't that the effect? Peter says, know this, know this. You're not alone. The second thing, number one, recognize you're not alone. But number two, remember that your experience is not in vain. Remember that. The hurts of life, your experience, you, those are not in vain. God has a purpose and will use it for a purpose. God can use our blessings. How many of y'all praise God for that? God can use our blessings. When all is well, God can use that. In fact, he warns us to be careful in our life when all is well. Doesn't he warn us about that? He says uh, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, he said, uh, when you're living in houses you didn't build and you're eating food from plants you didn't plant and you're drinking water from wells you didn't dig and you're so full, you've eaten so much that you're absolutely full all the time, he says, beware lest you forget the Lord. He warns us that in our blessings, we can forget God. So we've got to remember that God can use our blessings for his honor and for his glory. If you've got blessings in your life, praise God for the blessings of God. Don't apologize for those. Use them for God's honor and glory. That's what he wants to do through your blessings. But God also wants to use your hurts. What we find in chapter 1 of 1 Peter, you got your Bible still open? In chapter 1 of 1 Peter, we find, number 1, in verse 14, verse 14, that God will use the hurts of my life to make me holy. He's talking to these people about the trial of their faith, about their persecution, about their suffering, about the tragedies of their life. It's been hard living their life. But you get to verse 14, and he said, As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Verse 15, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. You know what God will do with the hurts of our lives if we'll let him? He'll use them to make us holy. He will. To make us more like him. In the 17th verse, he'll use it to get us to the Father. And if ye call on the Father who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, past the time of your sojourning here in fear, what's he trying to tell us there? You know what God wants to do with the hurts of your life? He wants to use them to make you holy. In the 17th verse, he wants to use them to get you to the Father. The hurts of life should not pull us away from God. They should drive us to our Father. Amen. They should bring us to God. 
They should cause us to just pray more than we ever have and to love more than we ever have. They're to bring us to God. All the tragedies, the disappointments, the sufferings. Have you ever been around a person who's gone through a terrible time and yet they're a blessing to be around? It's because their tragedy brought them to God. When I got saved, Brother R. Wood led me to Jesus and one night took me soul winning. As a sophomore in high school, I went soul winning with Brother R. Wood and after we knocked on a lot of doors and invited people to church and gave some the gospel, he said, Dave, son, before we go back to the church and call it a night, we got to go visit one of the shut-ins. I, I want to go by and encourage her. She never gets out. I want to encourage her. I remember stopping at that old rundown house, knocking on a door. A lady answered it. Can, can we see sister so-and-so? And this lady said, yeah, she's in her bedroom. And I remember Pastor Lockheed knew what he was doing, walked in. I followed him down the aisle there, down the hallway rather, and we stepped in this bedroom. The lights were on. I remember as a 16-year-old boy stepping into that bedroom and being shocked. That lady on that bed was so crippled. Her, her hands and her were like this. Her, her knees and her feet, she could not feed herself. She could not go to the bathroom by herself. She couldn't do anything by herself. But you know what I remember? I remember just a few moments into that visit. Wow, this lady's different. And the reason being is because she, pastor walks in. Here's what pastor said. We're going to go by there and encourage her. I discovered something that night. That wasn't why we were there. Pastor went by there every Tuesday night after soul winning visitation not to encourage her. He always said that was why. That wasn't why. He went by there because when you were in her presence, you felt like you were in the presence of God himself. She was just like, man, Pastor, isn't it wonderful to know Jesus? He's been so good to me today. And, and, and she, just, she just told him what an amazing preacher he was. And she just told him what an amazing God she had. And she just went on and on and on. And here this lady is who can't feed herself and can't bathe herself and can't get her, herself to the bathroom. Here's a lady that has suffered greatly in her life and yet had the joy of God all over her life. You know why? She never allowed the hurt to destroy her. She allowed it to make her holy. She allowed the hurts of her life to get her to God the Father. That's not the only one, though. In the 21st verse, he's letting us know here that God will use our hurts to build our faith and our hope. Look at that in verse 21. Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. God, I have nowhere else to go, but I can trust you. I'm looking to you, God. I don't want this. I don't like this. I wouldn't choose this on anybody. But, oh, God, here's my lot in life, and I'm facing this sin-cursed world of death and disease and destruction and disappointment and all the garbage of living in a sin-cursed world. And yet, oh, God, what I want from this is I want you to use it to build my faith and hope. You're my God, and you're good to me, and you're in charge. And, and I'm just telling you, God, I am full of hope because you are my God. That's what God wants to use it for. In the 22nd verse, he wants to use it to purify our hearts to fervent love. Look at that verse. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. What's he doing with the hurts of my life? He wants to make me sweet enough so that I just love everybody more than I ever have. Can I tell you something, brothers and sisters? You can't do that on your own. The hurts of life will destroy you on your own, but you have victory in Christ. And Jesus Christ is the one who can take the damages and the hurts of this sin-cursed world and do these great things in our life. I even like the 23rd verse. I'll close here in just a second. Because in the 23rd verse, he says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. In the context of suffering, you know what he's trying to say right there? God will use our sufferings, our hurts, to get us saved. He will. 
My friend Nick Anderson. Dad left when he was three. Mom moved him from San Diego to Las Vegas, and when he was five, got a job in the casinos on the night shift and left little Nicholas at home alone at the age of five. Fed himself. Raised himself. Got himself dressed for school. Took care of himself. Never knew his daddy. His were, those were tough times. Those were hard times. But you know what Almighty God did? When he was 18 years old, God used those hurts as a tool to bring him to Jesus, and he got saved. Three ladies on his job. Three ladies where he got a job after graduation. Three ladies on that job said to him, Hey, uh, Nick, would you go to church with us Wednesday night to our prayer meeting? And I've often thought that's the craziest thing in the world. Why would you invite an unsaved person to your prayer meeting? I'd invite them to Sunday morning service if it were me. But they invited him to prayer meeting. You know what happened at prayer meeting? He went to prayer meeting, sat on the front row, and they took prayer requests. And the youth pastor came down and said, Son, do you mind if I pray with you tonight? He said, No, it's fine. And the youth pastor prayed this. Dear God, Heavenly Father, those little words, Heavenly Father, grabbed young Nicholas's heart because he didn't have a dad. He didn't have that father relationship. And yet this youth pastor talked to God like he was real, like he was really his dad, like a father. And he went home with that mulling in his heart. He went to that church on Wednesday night to pray with that youth pastor for a month. And the youth pastor said to those three ladies from his workplace one day, he said, by the way, have any of you witnessed to him? And they said, no, we've been thinking we should. And he said, all right, then I better. And he took that boy out to play basketball, sat in a car after a basketball game, and led him to his father. Almighty God, through Jesus Christ. While you might be in the building tonight and angry at God because of the hurts of your life. But if you're not saved tonight, you know what God wants to do with those hurts? He wants to use them to draw you to himself so he can forgive your sins and become your heavenly father. How do you handle the hurts? I'm out of time. I'm done. How do you handle the hurts? You've got to recognize you're not alone. You've got to remember that your experience is not in vain. You've got to rejoice in all that is good. Read the Bible here and you'll find out he says, hey, I know you're scattered abroad living in a land where you don't know anybody. It's hard. I know it's hard. But rejoice. Keep a happy heart because when life is dark, when life is dismal, when you're discouraged and down, there's still a God in heaven that loves you and cares about you and is on your side. Don't ever forget that. He cares. He's good. Rejoice in all that is good. I could preach there a long time, but let me close. In chapter 5 and verse 8, do you all know that verse? Don't turn. You all know 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. Be sober. Be vigilant because you're what? adversary the devil as a roaring lion is walking about seeking whom he may devour. Did you know that the point of 1 Peter is that there's a lot of suffering in life. He writes five chapters about suffering and tragedy and facing the sorrows of life and being like our Savior who suffered for us on a cross 2,000 years ago. And he closes it out by saying, hey, you better, you better recognize that the enemy will use the hurts of life to do great damage in your life. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because you have an adversary who will say, see, God doesn't love you. Look what he lets you go through. See, see, you work so hard to raise your kids and now you're so disappointed. And the enemy will say, give up on God. Didn't work, did it? Give up on God. Just give in. Throw in the towel. Just quit. But brothers and sisters, that's the lie of the enemy. He'll use it to pull you away from God. What's the point I'm making? The point I'm making is that God wants us to have victory. 
So we have help. We got a Bible. We got to deal with hindrances. There's things in our life. We got to clean them up, straighten them up, improve them, correct them, make some changes because they're entangling us in such a way we've lost our victory. But the point tonight is all of us face hurts. And God will use the hurts of your life to bring victory to your life. That's part of spiritual growth. Who am I preaching to tonight? Who who am I talking to tonight? Maybe just one of you. Maybe just one person here is the one that, man, you're struggling and your heart is heavy. Then I would preach this message for you. Just you alone but I also preach it for all of us who are doing okay because it is inevitable that we will face hurts. And the devil is a master at using them to damage our lives. God wants us to win. Thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ even in the hurts.